morning. I see everyone here. Boy, I'm sick of the rain, aren't you? Well, today we close a three-week uh, series uh, that we've been going through. Um, it's been based in this idea of rest. We started two weeks ago with um, that we're created for rest. This is something that, that because we're created, it's something we need. And because it's something we need, it's something that God gives to us. You work the six days, you rest on the seventh. We need that time of rest. Last week... Uh, went into more of a rest for our souls. So yeah, our physical bodies need rest, but our souls need to be at rest. And we find that by sitting at Jesus' feet. It's in, found in the person of Jesus. And today, uh, we're closing out with staying in this place of rest. How do we stay rested? How is this something we continue to live in? And uh, so the example I'm going to give uh, this morning is of George Mueller. Uh, George Mueller was a missionary in the 1800s who started an orphanage in his own home in Bristol, England. Uh, he, he looked out into the world and he said, there's something wrong with this picture. There's all these children, homeless, living on the streets. And out of his compassion for them, he opened up his own home and started an orphanage. Now, he did this without fundraising. He did this without financial support. Uh, even when he was uh, asked to speak at various different locations, speaking engagements, he never took a penny. He did this through faith and prayer alone. And by prayer and faith alone, he had taken in over 120,000 children. What this kind of looks like is, got some examples. One morning in 1838, one of his staff came to George and said, we're, we're out of supplies after today. We have no more food after today. Uh, about 100 people that relied on uh, George Mueller, this, this, this orphanage, for their supplies. And so the staff came together after giving everything that they had, and they, they put the matter to prayer and then went about their business, their work for the day. George stayed in that position of prayer. Through the morning he prayed, and there was nothing. Into the afternoon, there was nothing. He continued on praying through the evening, and there was nothing. He kept impeccable journals, thankfully, uh, because we have them today. and We're able to, to read what it is that he wrote in these things of God's provision, the miracles uh, that he experienced. And, and he, he described in this feeling tried in spirit, which was something rare for George. And after having all these great experiences of God's provision, here he's feeling tried in spirit. And he wrote down these thoughts saying, how can I approach the children tomorrow morning and say we have nothing for morning meal? As he continued on in prayer, he realized something that, oh, this is for me. It's, it's to take me into deeper trust in Jesus. And the moment he connected with that, the bell rang. There was a woman at the door who gave them just enough for the next day's provisions. On another occasion, one morning, there was uh, one of the children of one of his staff was uh, hanging out. It was almost like a bring your child to work thing. And, and uh, so, so the child is there with the other orphans, and uh, she's standing around a table. And there's nothing in, in the cups, nothing in the bowls, nothing on the plates. And... Uh, George Mueller standing there with these children. He says, all right, now, children, we know we mustn't be late for school. And so he lifted his hands and said, dear father, we thank you for what you're going to give us to eat. No, there was nothing. No sooner had he said amen, there was a knock on the door. And it was the local baker who said, uh, now, George, the, uh, God kept me awake all night saying, um, I, I felt like you didn't have enough bread for breakfast. So I got up at 2 o'clock and baked this fresh bread for, for you and the kids. So there was bread. The baker left. Seconds later, another knock at the door. This time it was a milkman. His milk cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. And he started offloading his cans of milk to give to the children, saying, I, I need to offload this so I can get my cart fixed. So not only had they had fresh, fresh baked bread, but milk as well. George Mueller had this to say about anxiety and faith. He said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. The only way to learn strong faith 
is to endure great trials. I think this statement deserves a kind of uh, definition about what anxiety is. And anxiety isn't fear. Uh, fear is a, that's a normal, healthy, and, and a good emotion. Uh, it keeps us safe. It keeps us alert when we need to be. Uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane certainly felt fear and an anxious fear because it wasn't something happening to him at that moment, but he knew what was going to come. So that's not what this is. Anxiety is a reaction to fear. See, where fear causes your flight or fight responses to activate, anxiety causes us to avoid people, avoid places or situations that might cause us to feel anxious. Fear is an immediate response to a threat, whether that's real or perceived, it's, a, it's an immediate threat. Anxiety is an excessive contemplation of negative outcomes. Fear has definite triggers. Anxiety doesn't necessarily have to have any. So what George Mueller is saying is that this anxiety that he's talking about only happens when we've stopped trusting God. This kind of anxiety is one that you feel with consistency, it's not one you have at a specific time or over a specific thing that you know is coming up. It's something that's constantly churning, being contemplated in your mind, the possible negative outcomes through life. So George Mueller lived his entire adult life wholly and completely trusting in God for absolutely everything, including his daily bread. Now, I don't want to live like that. I, I, don't, I don't want to think about living like that. Uh, that that's, I like opening the pantry and having choices. I like opening the fridge and having choices, variety. Uh, so that, that's, that, I'm not saying that. There's an expertise that he has on this subject of faith that's incredibly rare. And, he, and in his time, it was probably unique only to him. There weren't too many people that had the same faith George Mueller did trusting God for his daily provision like that. But having lived in the full assurance that faith brings, he was able to endure trials of all kinds based on his prior experience with God providing. And such was the case with the church at Philippi. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, now Paul, he was uh, actually before uh, meeting Jesus, was Saul. He was out persecuting Christians of all things and on his way to do that of all places when Jesus met him. And because of that experience with Jesus, he turned to faith in Christ and ended up being uh, probably the most prolific missionary and certainly author of most of the books of the New Testament. And he's writing this letter to the Philippians. He's addressing a trial that they're experiencing, though it's not explicitly stated in the book. He's addressing it, and in his final remarks to them, his big takeaway, these are his words. Philippians 4, 4 through 13, or 4 through 9, rather. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, to remain in a place of rest doesn't mean that you remove all of the anxiety-inducing uh, people, places, situations from your life. That would be impossible. No, it's, it's learning to live with those things without the need for anxiety. In other words, without worrying about what may be. When you're living a Christ-centered life where your focus is on Him and His will, no matter what happens to you, you are completely and entirely safe. And actually, I'll rephrase that. Your soul is completely safe. Your being is safe. See, things like sickness, disease, broken bones, broken hearts, they're all still going to be experienced. But your soul is intact. Your being is whole. 
And we can go through life with anything, right? the good, the bad, the awful, and still come through it whole. And that's because he is near to us. He's near to us, both in physical and emotional proximity. Because Jesus is everywhere. He's omnipresent. The moment you cry out to him, he's right there with you. So physical proximity, but also emotional proximity. See, Jesus coming to earth wasn't, he he didn't simply die. He lived uh, 33 years. That's what they estimate anyway, 33 years. Jesus living for that amount of time, he knows what it's like to be a man. He knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to go through the things you and I go through. He's, he's a, he understands our pain, our needs, the needs of our heart. He understands our heartbreak more so than us. Everything we've ever been through, he's gone through. Everything we'll ever go through, he's been through. So he understands where we're coming from. And he went through all of that so that we would know that he knows what it's like to be human, to feel it all. So God is not some faraway, distant, or disengaged creator who did like a set it and forget it thing. No, he is intimately involved in every aspect of his creation, sustaining it both in life and in its health. His love and his care can be seen in every detail as he sustains us all. He is near to us because he's everywhere. And he's near to us because he knows what we feel. And he's near to us because of his great love for us that has no boundaries. So rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice because he is near. And because he is near, we don't have to be anxious. Because he cares about us. We don't need anxiety in our lives. He understands where we're coming from. He knows the outcomes. He controls the outcomes. He is sovereign. We don't need to be anxious. So rather than focusing on our problems, we should focus our problems on Jesus through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Prayer is simply being with God. Anytime you're, you're in a moment of prayer, you're, you're meeting, meeting with God. And if you think about that, it's really when, when you're in prayer, it's a miracle. It's a miracle taking place because you're communing with the supernatural. You're connecting with your heavenly Father, and you're coming to Him in the name of the Son, and you're doing that through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is involved whenever you pray. That's an incredible thing. At least I think so. So we come to him with our prayer, with our petitions. That's what, asking God for things. And then with thanksgiving. And here's where our faith is proven in the thanksgiving. So thanksgiving isn't just saying, hey, thank you for that. No, it's, it's living in the reality that what you've asked for, God has provided. That's a tough thing to do. Once you've come to the end of your prayer, being living out that thankfulness as though God has already done the thing for you. Thankfulness is a response to the genuine humility and gratefulness in our hearts. Thankfulness recognizes the generosity of our Heavenly Father, our older brother Jesus, and the Holy Spirit and their provision in our lives. Thankfulness reflects the reality that we need God's daily provision to sustain us. So as we submit our request to God in prayer and we live out thankfulness for his provision, we're told here that the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds. And this is a peace that transcends understanding. It defies human logic. It it defies conventional wisdom. It makes no sense. There's no earthly reason why we should go through life with all the problems around us and and go through them with, with this peace. There's no reason for it. So it's a peace that transcends all human understanding. And when you've released that burden of the outcome of your situations to Jesus, who is working all things together for your benefit and his glory, it says that his peace will guard your heart and mind. Like a bouncer standing at the doorway of your heart and your mind that won't allow things like fear or worry or anxiety in, unless we put them on the guest list. What we invite into our minds 
affects every area of our being. It infiltrates every area of our spirit. If you want stress, if you want anxiety, if you like fear, you like frustration, if these things are something you enjoy doing, then just set your heart and mind on the issues facing the world. When you watch the news and you debate politics with your friends, family, whoever, you know, that knock yourself out. But none of that's going to bring you peace. If you want peace, don't distract yourself from the eternal by focusing on the temporal. If you want peace, don't distract yourself from the eternal by focusing on the temporal. So we can retrain our brains by focusing on positive things. This is something that's possible to be done. Uh, psychologists all over say this is possible to be done. So it's not just a, a biblical thing. It's also, you know, we, we see it in, in extra biblical sources. We're able to retrain our minds by thinking on the positive things. And God gives us a nice list here of positive things to think of. And not only are they positive, they're, they're evidence that there is a kingdom of heaven. So these are the things we're invited to think about. Now, Michael preached on these uh, back in, in October, so I don't want to belabor them by any means. But uh, we retrain our minds by focusing our attention and meditating on things that are true, things that are honorable, things that are right, pure, lovely, admirable, virtuous, worthy of praise. When we focus, when we meditate on these things, that's how uh, we, we remain focused on the kingdom of heaven. And that's how we remain in a place of rest. There's something powerful about our, our focused perspective. Um, uh, the best illustration I ever saw of this was an Olympic martial artist, I think it was Taekwondo, came and visited my church when I was growing up. And, and he, he did this little illustration. He, he uh, called two of the, the biggest guys in our church, right, both about six foot five, 300 plus pounds, mostly muscle. They look like linebackers. Um, and, and this martial artist, he, he put his two fingers together like this. And at first, he's just using his, his own strength. So you can see the, the vein in his, in his head. He was a bald guy. So you see the vein in his head popping. You saw the, the strain in the neck, and, he's, and his fingers are crooked. He's pushing his fingers together. And he invited one of the guys, just one of them, to come up. said, grab both of my wrists and pull my fingers apart. The guy comes up, grabs both wrists, and in very little effort, pulled his hands apart. And he said, all right, let me, let me do something different this time. Puts his fingers together. And this time he stared right at that connection, right at that point where the two fingers were touching. And he didn't lose his focus. And he said, all I'm doing is imagining that there's, there's an invisible line running out from both fingers. And that as long as I keep those together, that, that those lines will, will stay together. That, that's what he's focused on, keeping those lines connected there, cross pattern. And then he invited the, the large guy back up and said, all right, now, now try pulling again. Not straining this time. He's just focused on it. No matter how hard the guy pulled, he could not pull his fingers apart. Then he invited the other guy up. Said, Each one of you grab one of my wrists. Two hands grabbing his arms, pulling his fingers apart. Couldn't do it. Then he invited up one of the men's sons, a little skinny little middle, middle schooler to come up. And he did the same thing. He said, now just focus on that spot. And no one could pull his fingers apart. The point that he was making was that if your focus is strong, you don't have to be. As long as your focus is strong, you don't have to be. What a relief. What an incredible burden that just sheds off of you when you realize you don't need to be strong. It's your focus on the things of the kingdom of heaven. That's what needs to be strong. The things you think about. Laying your cares on Jesus. I understand that it's really hard to stay focused when we're bombarded with bad news every day. When this world is waving its arms, shouting, saying, hey, look over here. It's hard to stay focused on those things of the kingdom of heaven. But just know that when we divert our attention and we look out there and we see the problems and we try to connect with them, we start worrying about them. None of that ever promotes peace. The bottom line is that we can't manufacture peace. Whether that's peace of mind, peace in our hearts, peace in our spirits, it's not something we can manufacture. It can't come from us. 
We're not capable of making that happen. And the more we try, the less peace, the less rest we actually get, we actually receive. Alternatively, there's no amount of bad things that happen, no amount of uh, bad experiences, negative change that can take away from our peace either. So everything is a matter of focused perspective. If the desires of your heart and your mind are focused on the things of earth, you know, that internal panic button is never going to be out of reach. It's always going to be right there with your hand on top of it, just waiting for the other shoe to drop, and then you can hit it. But the desires of your heart and your mind are focused on the things above in the kingdom of heaven, well then, you have to wait for God to press the panic button. And God doesn't press a panic button. The most absurd thing I think any of us could ever think of would be God freaking out about something. Like, oh no, what are we going to do? Gabriel, help me! I, 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 God, we, don't, we can't comprehend that. It's not, it's not something, it's silly. It's nonsense. It's ridiculous, right? To think of God freaking out about something. But because God doesn't do that, we don't have to either. Paul's closing exhortation is to imitate himself. Sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, be like me. No, but the, the only way you can get away with that <laughs> is if you have such a lived experience and such a lived experience that you don't wish it on anyone else, but that you invite them, hey, you see what I'm doing? Because of what I've been through, God has pushed me through shipwrecks, through beatings, through torture, through imprisonments, and through it all. Paul says a little later on, I've learned to be content with whatever state I'm in. So because of Paul's lived experience that he wouldn't wish on his enemies, He's inviting them, look at what I'm, I'm doing. Copy that. Live that out. Now, trials are going to come. We can't control the outcomes. So we shouldn't worry about them either. Life is just it's, it's better when we leave all that up to God and leave it in his hands. And trials are still going to come. And the results of, of the things that you, you put in God's court, you, you give him the ball and say, I'm trusting you with this outcome. Sometimes those outcomes, they don't work out in a way that you or I would see as favorable to us. But understand something, though, that God just might be drawing you closer to himself Suffering expands our soul's capacity to hold more of God. It chips away, cuts away at the internal stuff that's blocking his love from filling us more. And we can rejoice in that too. We're getting more of God. We're receiving the ability to take in more of his love. And we're still perfectly safe in the hands of a loving Heavenly Father who was intimately involved in his creation. And the first part of this passage you know, deals with resting in God. All right, so you, you lay down your petitions, you trust him with it with thanksgiving, you lay it down. The second half deals with our mindfulness. That's our focused meditations and our obedience to live out what we have seen and heard. When we rest in him, we're told at the beginning, we experience the peace of God. Right, so you, you, you lay down those requests, your prayers, petitions with thanksgiving. The peace of God will guard your heart and mind. When we add to that our focus on the things of the kingdom of heaven and we live out his word, what we're told is that we experience the God of peace. It's a both and. We experience the peace of God and we experience the God of peace. And in closing, what's the point of laying down our burdens if we're just going to pick them up and keep carrying them anyway? 
What's the point of prayer if we're not going to trust the one we're praying to to answer those prayers? Do you trust that the Lord is near to you personally? Is that a way that you lived? Would the way you live reflect that reality that Jesus is near to you? What occupies your thoughts? And what are you living for? Is it the issues of the things of the world or the issues of the kingdom of heaven? Or do you live in a state of joy because of it? And lastly, is there anything that you're anxious about? We're going to have a prayer team up here at the front. If there's something you're struggling with, maybe you want to be prayed over for it, I invite you to come. I hope that if you've walked in here feeling anxiety, whether it's something coming up that has an unknown outcome, maybe it's something you've been dealing with for a long time, and you're ready to be done with it, why don't you come and pray? I want to see God make a change in your life. Leave those prayer requests down. Don't pick them back up. By your prayers and petition with thanksgiving, make your request be made known to God. And his peace will guard your heart and mind through Jesus. And then as you leave, think about the things of the kingdom of heaven and live out the reflection of that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for your truth. We're thankful for the reality of your existence, your care, your attention, your presence in our lives. Thank you that when we, when we cry out, you are always right there because you're near. Would that be the lived reality? Or we, through our actions and our words, prove to the world at this peace of God that transcends understanding. May that be a reality that you're real, that your kingdom is real. I pray that as we leave this place, we'd be freed from any bondage of anxiety. As the burdens are laid down, they wouldn't be picked back up. that we live our life in the full assurance that faith brings. Live our lives with such faith, such proof that you exist, that you're real, that our experience, our lived experience would be one basking in the glory and the peace, the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.